the Sunday Papers podcast. I won't ask if it's online or paperback. Anybody. Read all about it. Read all about it. Sunday Papers. Coming to you live from Venice Beach in Santa Monica, California. Hot off the presses. Put your nose against the ink. Inhale. Feel the buzz, baby. What were they? Someone was telling us today someone was killed nearby. What was that? What happened? Yeah. Uh, about a block from my house. Uh, somebody from a, I don't know. It was a drug deal gone bad. Somebody got stabbed in the neck about a block away and uh, they died. Oh, jeez. Welcome to Venice Beach, baby. Oh, no, baby. no. An, an actor got killed. That's what he was saying downtown. Oh, yeah, no. I know. Same spot. Oh, oh the And an earthquake. You, Big earthquake. I was doing a podcast with Paul Shear and uh, and what Jason uh, Maza, what's his name? He's the voice on Big Mouth and Manzukas. Yeah, Manzukas. He, he and Paul have a podcast. So I was doing that on the day of the earthquake. And there we're in three different parts of L.A. And literally at the same time, we all went, holy shit. And we shook for like five seconds on the podcast. It was crazy. I saw a newswoman lose it and like kind of, in a good way, take control though. She was just like making sure everyone was all right. Uh, yeah. So did they keep that in the podcast? I don't know. I would imagine. I mean, it's kind of a special moment. I think it's a great, great moment. Yeah. Um, I hope one hits during this podcast. We can make a nice promo. Yeah, we need a good promo. And, uh, yeah, so, um, I'm about to go on the road for, uh, three weeks straight. I'm coming home for one day out of three weeks. I'm wow. doing, uh, New York. I'm doing a bunch of podcasts in New York and then I'm doing a bunch in Austin and then a bunch in LA. I have a big announcement that's coming out. Can't say what it is yet, but on, uh, Tuesday there's going to be a big announcement so pay attention to my social media, and you'll hear it. Big announcement Tuesday. Yep. Okay. Uh, you kind of had a big announcement today for I us. I did. I you did. Li- you lied to us. Well, we were playing golf. It was Fitzsimmons, Fitzgibbons, Gibbons, and Gubbins at Penn Mar. And uh, I said, guys, I got, I got some new merch. I want to give you guys all a present. Come out to my car. And instead of my beat up 2011 Toyota Prius sitting there is a two year old Ford Mustang. You did it, pal. Charcoal gray. I've you wanted a Mustang it. my entire life. And I finally, I could never spend a lot on a car. I mean, I didn't buy it brand new, but still, it's only got about 20,000 miles on it. It's goddamn gorgeous, it's fast. It's very good looking. I have to say, I normally don't like Mustangs, and it it looks a little more, dare I say, European than an American muscle car. Like, the lines are really nice on it. Yeah, it's got nice lines. I loved your reaction to it, because I think you've known how long I've wanted a Mustang and how much I've talked about it, and you just, like, froze. You're like, you did it? Yeah. You're always dreaming, the Prius dreamer. That's what you Oh, were. my God. You know, what the hell? I realize I'm 58. What the fuck am I waiting for? I get so worried about money in my life because you know what it's like. I got fucking two kids, and uh, who knows in this career if you're ever going to make money, and you get so worried. But then you just also go like, you know, how much more is there? Uh, I'm not a material guy. You get one thing that's fun. You bought a used car. It was great. Seriously. <laughs> like you, you treated yourself, but let's be real. You didn't treat yourself that well. No, no. And it's, is it a V8? Nah. I'll tell right. you what, the, the baseline Mustang, though, has a 305 in it. It's fast as shit. I can't imagine needing anything faster in L.A. than this car. Oh, I know. It's crazy. You, you want to see fast cars in L.A. Drive on the freeways. After midnight, they're out there racing. Oh my god, dude! It's like the West Side Highway in New York. West Side Highway, you get all those uh, Jersey grease balls coming in, yeah. and they're, uh, you know, and they're, now you're they're, one they're of muscle them. Muscle cars, yeah. Now I'm one of them. 
Um, no, the car is beautiful, man. I was I was very happy for you. It was very cool seeing it out there. Yeah. Well, thank you. I'm I'm, I'm happy, and I also we got a chance to see Gubbins today. I uh, last week I really kind of shit on him. I hit him hard about a gig that he invited me to. That it turns out we were not on. I was a little bit embarrassed, and I kind of laid into him. I might have gone a little far. So hold on. The whole debacle last week was a Fitz fact. It was one of these Fitz facts. You didn't have it straight? No, 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 no. I got it straight. Oh. I just, no, I just was meaner to him than I should probably be. Right. And he was hurt. And he wrote me a text. And then I called him and I apologized. Nice. Did I call him or text him? Uh, I think I texted him. And then I was on Call Kevin Nealon. Kevin Nealon has a show at the Laugh Factory on Monday nights where you um, you do stand-up and then you sit down and he interviews you for like 10 minutes. So during the interview, for whatever reason, he goes, are you good at apologizing? And I go, I just apologized today. He goes, uh, you did. He said, who to? I said, Dennis Gubbins. He goes, well, call him. Call him right now. So I called him live on stage from the Laugh Factory, and I think it's a podcast also. And Gubbins answered, and I apologized again, and he was so fucking funny. And he was like, Kevin, I just was talking about your wife today, and he has some funny story about Kevin's wife because she's an actress. And uh, and it was great. It was a fun call. But then, of course, he calls me like the next day. He's like, hey, is there any? I-, I think there's more we need to talk about. Yeah, like he needed to have another layer, which was fine. We talked about it. We're good. can you can you do Kevin's podcast again? <laughs> I want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he nice. books me on another podcast to talk about it. We get there and we're not on it. Uh, Neilan saw your car. I am assuming he did. And I go, Kevin. I've dreamt of having him. I said I used to play with Matchbox cars, and the Mustang was my car. And when I was little, I would stare at them. And to this day, I stare at Mustangs. And I go, and I finally bought one. And he goes, did you buy it new? <laughs> and my heart sank. I was like. <laughs> and then last night, I'm at the store. And I told Fahim Anwar about my new car. And he goes, let's check it out. And I go, and he goes, let's get in. And I got in. And we just sat there for like 10 minutes talking about the car and about other shit. And then he was like, uh, all right, man, I guess I'll see you later. And I realized as I'm driving home, oh, he wanted me to drive him around the block. Like he oh. got in my car to see how it drove. And I and just guys, sat there like an idiot. And you guys just made out. That's weird. <laughs> your first your first HJ in the new car. Mission oh accomplished. God. Can you imagine? I get the manliest car ever and it turns me into a queen. <laughs> turns me into a fairy. What words can you say? You can say queen and fairy. Fairy. I don't know. I've given up. I kind of yeah. say the words I want to say if I feel I have a good defense of yeah. them. Yep. Yeah. And I shouldn't talk about them uh, in a public forum like this. Maybe. Uh, I I call I called my daughter a bitch though today. Uh, not to her face, <laughs> but uh, so when we were driving across country, I didn't tell this part last week. She just got back from Asia. She was backpacking and doing all this stuff. And she was on malaria pills, including other things. So she then had stomach, some stomach pain, but like pain while swallowing, which she's never had in her life. And then, um, any, long story short, all of a sudden she like had a terrible night in one of the hotels. And then we're driving into Nebraska towards Agalala. And she's like, I have to see someone. I'm so worried. Like, it really hurts, and it's gotten worse, and I don't know. She's like, I'll go to urgent care. I'm like, Sophie, it's like, it was after dinner. I'm like, it's like 10 o'clock at night. There's no urgent care. And she's like, all right, well, then we'll go to the emergency room. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. I go, yeah. Um, I go, is there any way? I go, I looked it up. The urgent care opens at like 7 a.m. Why don't we? She's like, Dad, I, it, it hurts so much, and I couldn't sleep last night. And but anyway. I'm trying to walk a line between like saying no fucking way and dealing with her, you know, pain sensitively. So we go to the emergency room. Oh, there's it's, thousands of dollars right there. It's empty, right? Yeah. They're like, check her in. And she, so she walks up and she goes, 
um, I'm experiencing like chest pain. I'm like, no, no. I go, no. I go, no, she's not. And, um, and the woman goes, how old are you? And Sophie goes, you know, 20. And, um, she's yeah, 21. like 21, 21, sorry, 21, but it doesn't matter. It's 18. It's over 18. She goes 21. And then there was no more eye contact with me. I wasn't allowed to say a word. Yeah. She, the head, you know, receptionist, whatever, nurse receptionist who's uh, taking her in just looks at Sophie. Yeah. And I'm like, it, I go, but Sophie, please explain it's not chest. You don't understand what those words do in here. And so, all right, longer story short, they then check her out. All of a sudden I'm in there and I'm like, what's happening now? She's like, well, we're giving her an EKG. I'm like, e this is a digestive issue. Oh. I'm like, this oh is a digestive God. issue, please. And then Sophie was trying to backpedal like crazy. Like, no, 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 no. I've, I'm never shot. It has nothing to do with my breathing. It has nothing to do. I have this pain while swallowing in my chest. It's, it's by the sternum. It's behind the sternum, blah, blah, blah. I'm trying to explain. Anyway, got the bill today. Uh, let me uh, open my, here's the bill. So, oh, by the way, so we were in there. The doctor comes out, sees what the situation is. The nurse says he may want to do a PET scan. I'm like, he's not. And um, and then meanwhile, Sophie's getting angry at me because she's like, they're the professionals. I'm like, I know, but you've yeah. set them up. You've set them up to fail here. So yeah. I didn't say those words. So anyway, the doctor then comes in. They do a blood panel to make sure because they do notice that she was all over Asia and was just back. They see, they look, you know, up the side effects and some of the side effects are exactly this from the uh, medicine. And the guy kind of assesses it. And this is what we leave with. Why don't you go home? Uh, it would be more expensive if I gave it to you, but just get some antacids and see how that works. You're going to take that for a few days. And if it is a like fissure or whatever, a, um, a, I forget what it's called, but behind the sternum in your lower esophagus, then they'll check that out if indeed you do have some sort of like tear there. But this would be the first step anyway. So we leave with, he gives us the blood panel, everything, blah, blah, blah. And we then go to a fucking pharmacy. No, we went to a gas station. No pharmacy was open. <laughs> we went to a fucking gas station to get Tums. Yeah. And then the next day we get Prilosec. Anyway, the bill is $2,497. $2,497 in this great country of ours. And here's Sophie, to her credit. Uh, let me find. Yeah, my my health insurance cost me $40,000 a year. And oh. each member of my family has a $1,700 deductible before they pay a dime. What the fuck is that? So the bill was sent to Sophie, of course, because she's over 18. And all caps, yikes. And she goes, hope this is without insurance. I will never say chest pain ever again, I promise. Well, <laughs> that was I, hate, I hate to say it, Mike. I think she might be her mother's daughter. Well, I know. I mean, hopefully, I think she learned a little. But yeah, they're, yeah. The Jewish, the Jewish side of the family seems attracted to health care. Yes. It's a comfort. I believe it's a comfort for them. Now, the amount of times Aaron has taken our kids to the emergency room, and I'm just going, it's fucking nothing. Oh, I, I had to explain this over there in an email. I gently, it wasn't like a giant I told you. So I go, listen, this is how I phrased that. I go, listen, you know what? It's part of getting older. You realize you absolutely don't go to an emergency room unless you need it. And then I recalled my story. Like I ruptured my Achilles and the thing rolled up behind my knee and it was a Sunday. And then I got the, uh, an on-call doctor. Like I paged a doctor and they're like, the only thing you do is go to the emergency room. I'm like, could they do anything? They're like, no, they would tell you to go see a doctor tomorrow morning. Then, you know, rice it, you know, ice it, raise right, it, right. You know, compress it. And, um, and I'm like, that's what I'm, yeah, no emergency room, not a chance. Did I tell you on this show about 
I've got something in my shoulder. I've got like calcium buildup. Yeah. So I, went, I told this story, right? Yeah. Yeah. Wait, the, so follow, putting the it- follow-up appointment, which by the way, was $560 for me to drive there. Took 35 minutes to get there, 15 bucks to park. The doctor made me wait a half hour for the appointment in the waiting room. And then we had literally a 90 second talk where he goes, it's what we talked about before. So I'm going to, I'm going to refer you to another doctor. Any questions? I go, yeah. Couldn't this have been done over the phone for nothing, for no money? Or even some money. Yeah, I'll give you 80 bucks, but fucking 560 bucks? And no, the, med- the, 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 the healthcare industry in this country is completely fucked up. I mean, it's just such big money. Why do you think it's not going away? It's crazy. But if anyone has advice, so insurance hasn't tackled this yet. And then, by the way, I call them. I call the number on that fucking bill from these people. What is it? It's, uh, oh, I'm probably going to hear some crazy shit about this place. It is, I don't even know the name of the place. Anyway, they're like, um, they're like, all right, well, I could take your insurance. I'm like, you already have it. They wouldn't even talk to her before they had photocopies of the back and front of my card. They confirmed the information. She's like, well, sir, I was like, oh, so this is funny. So I go, so I'm dealing with this woman and then I start getting attitude because I'm like, you have the insurance. I go, and by the way, maybe it hasn't been put in yet. That's why I'm calling. I, I, I then retreat back to friendly mode. And she's like, well, sir, I keep telling you, if you want to give me your insurance, we can put this into the bill and see what comes out. I'm like, I'm assuming that's done, blah, blah, blah. At the end of the call, I go, she goes, all right. I And I gave her the information again. She goes, um anything else I can help you with? I'm like, well, if, if I don't hear back or like I, I, you told me to wait 30 or 40 days now, I don't want to all of a sudden be late on a payment when I've been told to wait 30 or 40 days. I go, do you have an I- identification number or uh-huh. I don't know how it, how it works there. She's like, well, I can give you my name. And I'm like, okay. She's like, it's first name money. I'm like, M O N E Y. She's like, yeah. Last initial G. And I'm like, money G. She's like, yep. And and she, and hold on. And she has a little bit of an attitude. And I'm like, this is in Wisconsin. I don't know where she is. It's probably a corporate office for oh, this for this hospital. Yeah. But this was in Nebraska. And so I'm like, okay. And I go, money G. I go, all right. Is there anything else? Is there an extension or you know something like in case they're wondering who I touch? She's like, nope. And I'm like, okay. Well, thank you. She's like. All right, have a good day. So then I sit there and I'm like, did I just be in that Google Money G? Of course, it's a rapper. And I'm like, oh, are you serious? Yeah, yeah, but hold on. So I'm like, <laughs> Money G. I go, did I just get like, I did I just get fucking completely blown off by this Money G? And I'm like, is that like a real? So I call back because I'm going to say, hey, you know, I just had a phone call, and I'll play innocent. I'm like, I just had a phone call, and I, I, I want to confirm who I talked to, and I want to see if you have a record of it, but the name was Money G. So I call back. Of course, I'm on hold forever, just like I was yeah. the first time. Okay. And then the the person answers, and it's like, thank you for your call. Your service, you know, your your satisfaction is our number one thing. She gives a little opening spiel, just yeah. like she did the first time. And then I'm like, this voice sounds familiar. And then she's like, um... And if uh, your satisfaction is not blah, 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 my name is Money. How can I help you? I'm like, no oh! way. So I hung no up. No way. That's hilarious. <laughs> so I hung up right on Money G before she recognized it was me. <laughs> Maybe Money G's career is not going that well in the rap world. And, no, I mean, uh, she's I, picking up a little work at a teleconference. Well, the center. Money G rapper I found was a male. But there was multiple money G's in the game, I think. But uh, I had to hang up before she realized it was Mikey G calling back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's pathetic. I hang up on money G. Poor money G. Oh, my God. This is my mother, money G. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> wow. So we'll see how yeah, that goes. Yeah, I swear to God, I am... I feel like a good portion of the reason why I have anger and stress in my life is dealing with having to call companies. The constant call, 
push eight buttons and then get put on hold for 22 minutes. It's so consistent. And then you get somebody who has to transfer you. And it's like, who has this time in their life? All right. Here's the best one. This, I'm going to keep this really tight. On my credit card bill, $10 every month. I'm like, wait, wait, wait. I didn't even like notice it. And I assumed it was the kids, the first two. It's been going on six months, say. PropertySearch.com. So I go on property search. I'm like, what the, what is this? Anyway, in this, in the visa bill, there's a number I can call. And also I found it online. I call them. This is how they answer the phone. Also, I can hear them at home, like doing home stuff, like kids in the background yeah. and stuff like that. So I call and they're like, swear to God, uh, thank you for calling this. Do you, um, my name is whatever. Do you want to cancel your account? First question. <laughs> First question. And by the way, and I called two different times. So I call and they're like, I'm like, yes, I do want to cancel. I'm like, who are you? What, what are you? She's like, I don't know. What is it for? I'm like property search. So this number is for a bunch of different scams, I guess. And then I, I looked in. Was it money on, G again? That's not money G. Someone take your money G. Someone online said, this is such a racket and went on to it. So they can't find my account. They're like, what is your email? Meanwhile, now I think my identity is getting stolen. That yeah, was the first time right, I called them. Right. They asked me for my email, the last four digits of my credit card, all this stuff. So yeah. I give them every email. I even gave them my old Earthlink one. They're like, we don't have anything. I'm like, well, you are taking $10 a month from me. I think you do that very efficiently. Yeah. There's no problem with that. It's the same. I go, you should be able to find it. I go, I you have my credit card number. Yeah. I eventually gave them the last like, eight digits of the credit card they asked for. I'm like, you're billing me. You should be able to find it. And they cannot find it at all. That means I have to like cancel my credit card. There's no way no, just to you block. you can contest a charge on your credit card. I know, but when you contest, at least this is what MasterCard, when you contest the charge, they're like, we're going to give you a new number and we have a new thing where we identify that one, but any other recurring charges like Apple Pay or, you know, I mean, like Apple.com or whatever, Netflix, those will remain. So it's not as big a hassle as it used right, to be. Right, 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 right. Yeah. But oh we're going to issue God. you a new number. But no, I went, we went they're through going to the call credit... me back within 20 days, they said. No, about a week ago, me and Aaron sat down with the, we have three different credit cards. We went through to look at recurring charges. We have uh, Hulu three different ways. Because, you know, you got Roku on your TV. Yep. And you can order channels through Roku. We got it on there. And then somehow me and our, like, we have so many recurring charges. It's There's like a hundreds service, of dollars a month. Kind of like those things that clean your Mac. Like, you have duplicate photos. You have duplicate yeah. files. There's a service that does that for your duplicate really? subscriptions. Yeah, I've seen an ad for it. Is it an app? I don't I think it is an app. Yeah. All right. I'll do it. Um, all right, let's get going. We got a logo this week that I thought you'd like from Rick Prickett. Look at it. Little Calvin and Hobbes. That's our big send-off. Our right, final so one was last week. Little Thank tease. God. Little tease. So I looked up the best Sunday comics of all time. Number one is Calvin and Hobbes on Ranker, Ranker.com. Number one is Calvin and Hobbes. Number two um, for is Farside. Fine. Fair enough. Number three. Anyway, I'm doing a new comic. Uh, I'm doing the 10 best of all time. I'm starting with number 10 at the end. It'll be a surprise what it is. Oh, boy. Here we go. Uh, hopefully it's actually a bad one this time because I think there was 100% pushback on Calvin and Hobbes from our listeners. It was uh, like you taking on Elvis. You just don't do it. You just don't. All right. Pearls Before Swine. Have you ever heard of that? Yes. That was number four. Oh, three was Peanuts. Yeah, I love Peanuts. Look at my hat. Look at my Six hat. Six right is now. Dilbert. Seven What's is on my hat? Trot. Let me. No, no, I know. I'm not doing Peanuts because I don't want to crush you. Because they were never, ever, That's ever, 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 ever funny. Uh, uh, six, th six is Dilbert, and seven is Foxtrot. I'm doing the fifth best of all wow. time. Okay, so no Blondie, no Hagger, no Lockhorns in the top 10? Turns out, I know you don't listen to our podcast, we do those already. No. Uh, the song this week, I got to tell you something. We appreciate That's everything you guys send us. It really is generous. But sometimes somebody puts something together that is like, wow. I mean, 
That song today is is from the Someday Believers, and it is just extraordinary. And we thank you so much when you when you go this far and do something that great. It's so cool. Um, corrections. You also tell us when we suck. Uh, you've mispronounced my name on your podcast a few times, saying. Dvorak instead of Dvorak. It seems to induce dyslexia with most people. To help you remember how to pronounce it, I created a caption for a Kathy cartoon. Kathy's mom. I walked in on your dad banging the neighbor's lady, Ooh. so we're getting a divorce. And Kathy goes, Ack! That's right. My last name is pronounced Dvorak. Hope that helps. That's one of the <laughs> clearest explanations I've ever heard. <laughs> you ought to know by now, Greg. Uh, Rick said, please give Mike my condolences. There is nothing really to say beyond that because every situation is unique. He goes on to say, you have a Hagger obsession and there is a great series about the Vikings, why they came about, what they did. It is also part of Irish history. The show is on the History Channel. Um, I'll watch that. I don't remember how the irish are i know that ireland was invaded by the vikings in like the 11th century um i think that's where we get our red hair from is that possible maybe but how are you unclear on how it's part of irish history then i just don't remember the details i don't remember who came and i think we were in the victim column yeah we were invaded by a lot the spaniards came in the celts yeah uh then we got Bowles McLean says uh, the famous crowded car scene in the Marx Brothers movie is actually from A Night at the Opera, not Horse Feathers. Uh, my mistake. We watched both those movies in the same week, and I guess I got them confused. Also, my name is pronounced Bowles, B O W L S, Bowles. And the last name, McLean, is pronounced same as Officer John McLean of the New York City Police Department. I have someone here, someone who invited you to the party. That's from Die Hard. Look at these explanations. Did these two get together on ways to use entertainment to ex- to explain the pronunciation of their names? Rich McCabe said The Simpsons was never a comic strip. The creator of the show, Matt Groening, wrote a strip called Life is Hell. It was we. Th- there's been a lot of discussion on this, and I think this is the summation and the truth. It was brought to the attention of James L. Brooks, who asked him to pitch Brooks some shorts, which he used on the Tracy Ullman show. Uh, as for Mike remembering it in a movie theater, he is probably remembering a scene from Die Hard 2. We were just quoted from Die Hard. Uh, in the movie, as the planes are circling D.C., the crew plays an episode of The Simpsons where the family is in group counseling, electrocuting each other. No, uh, this ran before the movie. Yeah. Uh, On a personal note, my mom died today after a long bout, four years with Lewy body dementia, which is actually my wife's father died of that. Uh, With most of that in hospice at home, this show has been a happy release today, so thanks to you and Mike. Um, It's a horrible way to go, Lewy body. sort of buried the lead on this. Okay, so sorry, Rich. Jeez. Yep, sorry about that. Ugh. It's you know, a, so, someone also wrote me that um, it was really sweet. Uh, it was a, a relative from the divorced side, the other side, and it was so sweet he reached out. And um, he talked about his mom died of Alzheimer's 10 years with it. Oh, like, yeah. No, um, uh, Lisa's mom just passed, and she lived with it for a good 10 years. And, uh, you know, uh, Josh... Josh's uh, mom has had it for probably 10 years also in full care. Like that shit's like a hundred grand a year. It's, it's only two and a half times your health care, right? <laughs> your insurance, which you don't, which you, you know, sometimes don't use. At least they're getting care. Uh, Meep, Meep Zork said the correct name of the date rape drug is Roypenol. They are called roofies because the date rapists are idiots. A oh, root roof. No offense to Brian from Chicago. I guess it's called roofinol, rope, ropinol. I don't know. Why do you know this? People are really, yeah. 
Oh, we oh, got another one on, on uh, Simpsons. Ullman filed a lawsuit in 1992 claiming that her show Total. was the source of the Simpsons' success and therefore should receive a share of the show's profit. I breastfed those little devils, she once said. <laughs> She wanted a share of the Simpsons merchandising and gross profits. Believed she was entitled to 2.5 million of Fox's estimated 50 million in 1992. The Fox network had paid her $58,000 in royalties for the Simpsons, as well as $3 million for the three and a half seasons her show was on the air. Eventually, the courts ruled in favor of the network. That's Whoa. From Tim Keefe. All right. Well, she so, did all right. Not really. Think about what that show has grossed over the last 25 years. You know, I heard a story about when Fox was, not when ABC bought them, but I forget. Anyway, it was a big corporate thing. And then, so the bean counters came in and they're like, what is this coffee thing? And so they put the kibosh on the Fox lot here on Pico. And George, my brother-in-law, worked there. All of a sudden, like there was no, even if you're staying late, there's no Simpsons uh, sorry, Simpsons. There's no Starbucks orders coming into the building anymore. Like you're using the coffee in the kitchen, blah, blah, blah. So then they went to the Simpsons room and I should know the name, but anyway, the head of the Simpsons is like, wait, what's this issue? And the, then he's like, uh, well, I'd like a meeting. And so they have a meeting like, what don't you understand about this? There's no more Starbucks coming in. And he's like, Look at the one. You see that building? We built that building. See that one over there? We built that. You see that one we built there? Get the fuck out of my office. <laughs> and the Simpsons still got Starbucks. It's <laughs> that's hilarious. About, yeah. That's yeah. exactly how it should go. Well, when we worked on Ellen, the show was making boatloads of money. It was syndicated in every city. It was winning awards. And, and then they just... And then, you know, telepictures just cutting money so they same thing cut the coffee runs then they cut the sodas yep and then they cut the snacks like there was just simple snacks in there for people that were working until 11 o'clock at night they just kept cutting people slept executives were lining their pockets yeah crazy they're Um, one they're wondering why it is such a shit show now you put non-creatives you didn't even put lawyers who worked in a creative place uh, in charge. Like you, these are just people so far away with how this animal works. Um, here's how this animal works on the road. I'm coming to Louisville. Uh, the comedy works August 23rd and 24th, a comedy club. Then I'm going to the comedy works in Denver, August 29th to the 31st, the mothership in Austin, September 6th through the 8th, Temecula, Montserrat winery, September 21st, then I'm coming to Alaska, Tulsa, Tacoma, San Francisco, all dates and tickets at fitzdog.com. Probably Montserrat. Montserrat. I might be wrong. I think you're right. What did I say? Montserrat? Montserrat. Uh, also, if you hear the podcast today, which would be the 18th of August, mm-hmm. tonight the Comedy Store will host Brody Fest, which is a comedy showcase going to be a lot of big names performing. They're raising money for Comedy Gives Back, who we're very close to, everybody over there. They Perfect. raise yep. money for comedians in need. They get uh, drug rehabs and uh, health insurance. I should go to them for my health insurance. You sure should. So go to the Comedy Store tonight for that. Uh, let's get to the front page at 34 minutes in. Here we go now. Here we go, here we go, here we go now. All right, so this actually should have gone under corrections because uh, last week we reported on this story, and it ha- it's, an e- it's an evolving story. Uh, the cause of death for the 57-year-old woman whose body was found in a baggage area at Chicago's O'Hare Airport last week has been revealed. Virginia Christine Vinton died by suicide on oh. Thursday, August 8th. Uh, hanging by asphyxiation. She was seen on a video entering an unoccupied restricted area at 2.30 a.m. She was found entangled in a conveyor belt system in a baggage room. And I'll tell you what, this is why I only carry a bag on the plane. Is that why, Greg? Never check luggage. (laughs) It's too much. Well... 
adding insult to injury, the baggage handlers still technically consider her luggage, so they robbed her. <laughs> they did it. Yeah, really? they did. Yeah, they took oh everything they could. God. That's what they do in the middle That's of the morning when bags brutal. are in there. Yeah. But um, she was easily identified. That was the good news because she had tied a little red ribbon around uh, the handle of her pants just so she could easily pick herself out on the conveyor belt. I think it might have been around her neck, actually. Oh, I don't know no. if it was on her pants. I wasn't mm. going there. No. Uh, this is yours, right? Oh, no, this is mine. No. New York trademark attorney Jeremy Green Eck is a Kam Kamala Harris supporter who hopes that this VP is successful in her bid for the White House because he bought a number of web domains with her name back in 2020. Uh, this guy apparently picks up domain names for like $10 and hopes to sell them at a profit later. Uh, it's really paid off for him. Four years ago, he purchased Harris Walls, Harris, W-A-L-Z, an internet domain made up of Harris' last name and that of her running mate for $8.99, $8.99. This week, he sold it to somebody who identified himself as a Harris supporter for $15,000. I'll tell you right now, there is no way that that's that buyer was not a conservative super PAC who's going to give it to Pornhub for free. Yeah, or worse, Trump. Right. No, I mean, no. I wonder I wonder how much she had to pay for the photo of the black guy squatting with the big dong that's going to be linked to that website. The guy also bought the domain name, uh, name uh, I don't think she's black dot com, <laughs> and also January six. A part to do. Oh, don't even say it. Dude, yep. what are the odds that if Kamala wins, there will not be civil unrest? Uh, well, you're hoping he loses by a lot, right? I mean... It, it would have to be a lot. I mean, of course we're hoping... A lot. Of course we're hoping he loses by a lot. But if, if, if your only game was you don't want to see any shenanigans, then what you're hoping for is a really definitive win. Yep, which I don't think we're going to have. Oh, no. All right, what do we got next? Well, this is called the one where five people were charged for the fatal drug overdose of Matthew Perry, who was found dead on October 28th, 2023. I don't know if you saw what I did there, but Friends episodes were famously called the one where... Uh, oh, I would know that. I never watched one episode. Oh, no, but if you're on TV, you wouldn't have seen it. You just have to kind of know about their scripts, and it's like uh -huh. the one where Monica, you know, uh, blah, 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 blah. So clever. The suspects named in the federal indictment were identified as doctors, these two doctors, Placentia and Chavez, and then Kenneth Iwamasa. One's a Santa Monica doctor, and then his live-in assistant, uh, and broker Mark Fleming, and accused drug dealer Jasveen Senga. Damn. And Pe Perry began buying drugs from Jasmine Senga, um, and she is called the Ketamine Queen of Los Angeles. And is might that a I pageant? Might I suggest it's her? It's a pageant where everybody just is slumped over on the stage. <laughs> she was runner-up the year before, but now she now she has the crown. For her talent uh, section, she'll be drooling and twitching. Might I suggest she try to shake that handle before appearing before a judge? <laughs> Does she get sworn in, sworn in as the ketamine ketamine queen? <laughs> her daughter's acting up. She's like, don't be such a princess. She lives in North Hollywood, and she sold ketamine and other drugs and provided Perry's assistant with the dose that, dose that ultimately led to his death. Um, investigators said Matthew Perry fell back into addiction during the fall of 2023 between September and October. And uh, these people supplied 70 vials of ketamine to Perry. I mean, with friends like that, Greg. Oh, God. I think it was the hot tub was too hot. You can't you can't put it above 103. Makes you drowsy. How's that assistant doing, by the way? And how is that assistant getting his next job? Like, yeah, no, I've worked, I've worked, I, I know the drill. I've worked for famous people before. Oh, yeah, who? Well, you know, various, various people. And, Let's just uh, say. Did everything I, for them. I keep my bosses very calm. They, <laughs> they're very low key when I'm around. That's just terrible. I mean, that poor assistant, I think. I mean, blood yeah. is on their hands. Yep. 
Oh, my God. I'm not saying it's their fault, but blood got around and some is on that person's hands. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's skip this one and go right on to entertainment. You got it. Here we go. Oh, soft paper, soft paper. Billy Eilish dropped agency mogul Casey Wasserman on Tuesday in the aftermath of his high-profile extramarital affairs scandal. Wasserman, um, oh, Wasserman's the agency, too. Wasserman's CEO. He's also the committee chairman for LA 28 Olympic Games. Um, he formerly served as a live booking representative for the superstar Oscar and Grammy winning singer. Um, fallout around Wasserman began after a Daily Mail expose on his years long practice of sleeping with female employees broke earlier this month. You so, got to practice. If you want to get good, you got to practice and practice sleeping with the female employees. 10,000 hours. That's what they say. The report left Eilish very upset by the allegations as she prepared to part ways. It was finalized Tuesday following the singer's performance in honor of LA 28's Olympic, uh, Olympics, that whole ceremony alongside the Chili Peppers, Snoop Dogg. Um, yeah, so she think, is cutting ties. I think she must have, she was so mad, I think she must have strained her voice yelling at this agent because she clearly lip synced that song in Long Beach for the Olympics. I think she might have manifested this bad guy. Isn't that the name of her song? That's um, why you don't dwell on the negative. You attract it, Greg. Wait a minute. You know Billie Eilish songs? Oh, I went to I, I saw I saw her concert. Did you like it? I loved it. I really like her. Is it a lot of whisper singing though? Or does she No, does it she gets get... very well, I sent you her song on the Saturday Night Live two years ago, maybe three. Okay. Was pretty extraordinary. And no, no, no. Grammys. I have been absolutely swept away by Billie Eilish. I find her to be very talented, but I've tried to listen to albums and I feel like I get it's a little too whispery after a while. It can be. It's a mood. It's definitely a mood. Um, all right. Here's a long story, but I need to read it all because it's pretty it's pretty good. It's sort of ironic that it hasn't gotten shorter. Go ahead. All right. Comedian Kevin Hart has finally confessed about the night in 2017 when he cheated on his wife, Aniko Hart, with a random woman in Las Vegas. Aren't they all random in Las Vegas? Randos. In the On that fateful night, he was he said he was coerced to do Molly by an, uh, by an unnamed friend. Maybe the name was Molly. Unfortunately, not only did the drug take him on a trip, but according to some, it almost cost him his entire family. He admitted he was hesitant to take the drug. Huh. No, I don't really fuck with drugs like that, he told the friend. But the ride-along actor broke his pal, br broke after his pal's relentless nagging. Oh. He said in, in the disposition, fuck it, I said. I put it in my drink. Had some water there, blah, blah, blah. I'm fine with drink, and the night is good. He met a woman named Mon Montia Sabag. Hart stated that he bought Sabag and another woman named Morgan to his hotel room, despite being married to wife Iniko, who was home pregnant with the couple's first child. Uh, the actor testified that Morgan did not spend the night. And then there's some stuff that's redacted here. Um, Sabag was not able to get him to bed, uh, get him to bed her that first night that they hung out, but in the morning she was able to entice him into having sex with her. I guess he was he's strong at night, not so much in the morning. I did not have sex with Montia that night. He said I had sex with her the following morning. She woke me up. He broke down. He said uh, he said that she was trying to get closer to the hidden camera that ultimately recorded their rendezvous. I'm guessing. What? I'm guessing Tom Brady put him up to the put that girl up to this. He's still pissed about the roast. Although it it did predate it did predate the roast. Oh, uh, that's right, that's right. But anyway, what were you gonna? You, you tap into exactly my reaction. Well, I think that he he's not to blame. He blames his friend for making him take the drug. The woman yeah. forced him to have sex. Oh, and I guess his accountant forced him to do ride along too. And night night school, you know, an apology for this egregious act. It was a pretty low bar, but no bar is low enough for Kevin Hart. I think da, we can da, 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 agree da, on that. Da, da. Um, 
What a victim. Look how many times he's the victim. Yeah. Is this story that he he finally confessed to being a victim, I guess? Here's the bottom line. You can't be that famous and go to Las Vegas. Bad shit is just going to happen. You know what I mean? Like, especially when you're, he's the kind of guy that's always in the middle of it. He's always at the, at the, this party and that party. And he's with a bunch of pe- people that are talking him into doing drugs. You don't go to Vegas like that. Bad shit's going to happen. I mean, I wish I had this guy on the stand. If that's what's going on, is this a, where did he confess? He admitted, wh- where was all this? He, oh, there was a, it was a, it's, it's a, I, cu- I had to trim this story down. Basically, his friend, he's suing his friend, or his friend is suing him, so there was a trial, and this all came out in the trial. Oh, my God. That's the thing about guys like Kevin Hart. You end up getting sued or suing your closest friends because there's so much money. I That's why I have just, I like I say, I crawl my way to the middle. I'm staying right there. Nobody wants shit from me. You're Except saying it was short, short-sighted end. of Kevin to uh, grab no, the fame no, ring? There it is. There it is again. And even if they put him on the stand, you're not going to see him. <laughs> you have to stand, sir, while your hand is on the b- I am. <laughs> but if I had him on the stand, I'm like, all right, hold on. First of all, I think you're a, yet a, a victim again. You clearly couldn't get it up that night. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and you somehow are painting it as your defense yeah. That you spent the night with her, and then I just want to be sure of what I heard, Mr. Hart, that in the morning, when you're no longer under the influence of drugs, that's when you decided to sleep with her. Yeah. Like, I think I think you messed up there. You should have been uh, judgment impaired on drugs when you made that decision. I mean, look, at the at the end of the day, the story's coming out. Why not tell the real story, that it was a three-way the night before on Molly, you know? Yeah. If you want to be a legend, tell the story. So weird. Uh, let's get to, um, oh, this is good. Brandon Thomas Lee uh, was kicked out of a fancy country club. It's Tommy Lee's son, uh, Pamela Anderson's uh, son as well. And uh, he got into a shouting match with a fellow member on the golf course. Uh, Apparently, BTL was driving too close to the green when a member who lives on the course spotted him. Uh, The guy wanted to document the violation, started filming him. And then Brandon started yelling. And uh, the guy sent the videotape to the club's board. And apparently that was the last straw because multiple people at the country club say that Brandon was rude to the staff at the club. And on top of this incident, that was enough for the club to yank his membership. Wow. I mean, I wonder when things in his life got weird. The kid. Yeah, maybe it was like 24 years ago when when both his parents got shit-faced on a yacht and taped his conception. (laughs) There's a creation myth for you. Like, hey, what's up, man? Yeah, I saw you. uh, I saw your mom get pregnant with your dad. So. Tommy Lee loves golf, so we can't say who. Do you know about this story? So no. First hand. This is a first hand um, story. Uh, he loved playing golf, and somehow the golf course that used to be up in the Malibu Hills, which some rich guy bought and closed, but there's there used to be I think a nine hole course. Did you ever play it? No. It was in oh, the hills. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I did. It was called Malibu Country Club. It was something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So it was very hilly. But it was public, and yeah. So yep. anyway, Tommy's playing, and uh, and a friend who we know is playing with him, and he sinks this really long putt, and they're completely wasted. He sinks this really long putt and goes, oh, no way, and like holds it, like, you know, he's celebrating and going crazy, and then he pulls out a lighter, and it's this beautiful wooden putter, apparently, and he turns it, and then like like flips this little lid revealing it's a pipe the putter is a pipe and lights up a bowl at the end and sucks through the handle in this super long putter pipe That's and amazing. then they pass it they pass it around like it's like you know some native american sort of wampum 
It's not wampum. What would it be? Like anyway, a peace pipe. And yeah. um wampum is money, I think. Anyway, yeah. and that story is true. Wow. Allegedly. I guess I should I add allegedly. It took two hits. Was it a two putt? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mine would be a three putt. That's how I roll. Yeah. Oh my god, that's amazing. Yeah. I love when rock stars get into golf. Like, you know who's like a three handicap? Or he gonna, was? I Alice do know. Alice Cooper. Yes. Alice Cooper. I've heard that. He lived on the course of the Biltmore in Phoenix, which is like a legendary golf course. Um Love it. All right, let's all right. go to Florida. Make America Florida. Speaking Here we of go. golf. I just loved this headline. It's not the greatest story, but I love the headline. Florida man accused of running big Ponzi scheme, buying big boat. <laughs> what, I mean, what a Florida headline. Yeah. Normally the headline ends with like is convicted or has been assigned probation or is going to jail. Something. Nope. Buying big boat. And it's so childish. It's kind of like another like man who stole car getting big ice cream cone. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, right, it's just right. a ch- so this guy had a. A uh, hedge fund, and it was a pyramid scheme, or he had a pyramid scheme. I don't know if it was a hedge fund, and um, he had spending habits. The article said were typically Floridian. Last October, he transferred three point one million from the J.P. Morgan account for a yacht called Stillwater, and then two million from and two million of that came from investors' funds. He later re- renamed the boat Live More. Then he spent $320,000 on clothing, jewelry, and beauty treatments. He spent seventy dollars on Diamonds Direct, $76,000 on Louis Vuitton. Sounds like spend more. Uh, $7,800 on Drip IV. You know what that is? No. For partying, like you, you order the IV to oh, come to your house. Spent yeah. almost 8000 on that in St. Petersburg, Florida. He spent considerable funds on luxury travel and vacations, including at least $4.6 million on chartering jets and luxury car services. Wow. Yep. Damn. And, and then he spent $750,000 on automobile-related, uh, including $92,000 on a Jaguar. Yep. Meanwhile... I spent a chunk of my kids' college fund on a used Mustang. So I don't feel as bad. It's very important that used is in there. Yes. It really is. Yes. Um, all right. Let's make Sturgis Florida. Finally. Finally. So a lot's been going on, and we took a week off. So Sturgis happened, and I just thought of it today. So I looked it up. So the 84th Sturgis Motorcycle Rally has come and gone. Over nine hectic days, the police department has kept a record of phone calls and crimes. And now we can look back and have a look at the overall crime trend. The 84th rally had a 13.27% higher rate of drug arrests than the 83rd. Wow. Additionally, additionally, there were twice as many assaults and 64.7% more drivers with no insurance. Woo! Sadly... 12 motorcyclists died on the road. Oh. 10 of the people killed in the crashes were driving Harley Davidsons and two were riding other kinds of motorcycles. I could have done that math. Two of those who died were from South Dakota, others from Iowa, Tennessee, blah, blah, blah. Three of the 12 were wearing a helmet. Mm. Three. Only three were wearing a helmet while seven were not. That's not really the math. Oh, two died out of town. Sorry, two died out of town. So the math is a little off. Um, And then I read some of the Sturgis stats. Let me go get these for you. Um, Here we go. Let's see here. Um, Anyway, all of them are as you'd expect. uh, But where the fuck? Oh, my God. The thing. Sorry, it updated. I wanted to see. You wouldn't believe, of course, they're all old guys. Uh, the fucking thing updated because it's a newspaper. I had it up here. And they're all on Harley Davidson's, and they are all over 60 years old. Maybe we can do that uh, on the next podcast if we want, where I they typically read. They were all read, over 60? Well, the two who died um, who were not on Harley's 
were younger. Okay. And the, but all the ones on Harleys were over 60 years old. Damn. It's the typical thing. They lose control of their vehicle. They go over the yellow lines. They run into cars. They cannot negotiate turns. So I'll try to find these things again. Um, it's crazy. Wow. Yeah. And I wonder what it costs to insure a Harley if you live in South Dakota. And if you're over 60. Yeah. And yeah. if you don't wear a helmet, I bet you you have to tell the insurance company whether you wear a helmet. I don't think you do. Because yeah, any they day you could just be like, I questions. forgot it at home. There's a new thing now where um, insurance companies, they well, the car companies will tap into uh, a safety log on your car. And the insurance company will say to you, we will give you a 15% discount if you allow us access to your driving activities, which lets them literally tell how many times you had abrupt stops, how many times you sped, how many times you turned fast, and they will drop you, and you won't be able to get insurance from anybody else because they'll know why they dropped you. And people are opting in for this discount. Well, I remember, I think my, I leased an Acura uh, SUV, and- they would all of a sudden tell me things like, oh, you're at this mileage. It's time for your check. Yeah. And I'm like, I, I didn't realize I was being monitored. All right. So. Oh, yeah. I probably uh, unwittingly didn't go out of my way to tell them not to do that. Uh, all right. Let's go to some sports. Sports. Here we go. Sports, sports, sports. There's only one sports story we're looking at this weekend. If you're listening to this on Sunday, I don't know where it's going to stand, but we're oh, recording yeah. on Friday night, and my cousin, Danny McCarthy, is currently in the lead at a major tournament, the St. Jude's. It's a FedEx tournament. Uh, all the big players are there, and uh, he's he's in the lead. So we'll see where it is on Sunday. He uh, sometimes struggles on the weekends. He uh, he might, it's very hard to keep a lead, but we'll see where he's at. We wish him well. Good luck. Fingers crossed. Come we on, talking, Danny. We this is the one. about him today, man. I guess he eagled one of the holes. Really? Yeah. Oh, speaking of that. So I just got a text from a guy, you know, who, uh, who I worked with at CBS. He happened to be at Penmore and he goes, Oh, I'm here thinking about you. Maybe coffee soon. Fine. Just got an update three three minutes ago. Just ran into your friend Dennis, who's on mushrooms, and got an eagle on four. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best Dennis update. That's, That's good news for Govins. Well, I should have done it. We should have had a good news for Govins. Now, just so people know, four is the easiest hole in the course. It's a very short par four. It's... It's drivable if you hit your absolute best drive and there's wind behind your back. So he may have gotten it like to the fringe. No, he sent a picture. A he drove in. the green. He did? Yeah. Wow. And he uh, made the putt. Yeah, I got that. Yeah, that was a big one. I got that uh, update earlier. Then he sent other updates where the shrooms weren't, were not affecting his play in that way. It went the other way. Well, on his morning round, we played this morning with him, and uh, he was even par. He parred every single hole. No birdies, no bogeys. Boring. Yeah. Uh, let's go. Should we do international? We got, um, I think let's skip that one about the college kids. Um, let's go down to international. Done. We're already all the way down there. The School of Management and Business at the Vietnam National University in Hanoi believes the connection between height and success is so significant that people who are supposedly too short should no longer be allowed to study. The school announced that female students must be at least 1.58 meters tall and male students at least 1.65 meters. How big is that, 1.65 meters? Um, uh, to be considered for admission this year, I think it's five two. Well, a meter added, is a meter. I think is thirty three inches. I think. So, all right. Uh, what is it? One point six meters. One point six five meters. Hey Siri, how tall is one point six five meters? 
It is 5.4 feet. 5.41 feet. Uh, so a, so 40% of a foot is three inches. So it's five foot three inches. Right? I don't know. 5.4? Yes. Yeah, it would be about five. No, yeah. Yeah, four, five, four three and a half. is 40%. 40% five. of 12 is three. Perfect. It's five uh, so four anyway, one. forget the height. If I'm back in college, I'm keeping out the fat chicks. Am I right? How about like a <laughs> weight limit? Who cares about height? <laughs> that's so I old, wrote a joke here. <laughs> uh, I, I don't understand my joke. Did you change the setup? There was something written in there. Literally, this is what I wrote. I thought that said black. Mm. Oh, because I think I read your joke if I was back in college. Uh. And I'm like, I thought your premise was if I was black in college. <laughs> no, it would be the opposite. You want, you want some ass. Well, listen, this is what I will say. Einstein and Stephen Hawking, they were both 5'7". No, Stephen Hawking was 3'4". True. True. Yeah, I would uh, say that's a real case of he was five foot seven on a good day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's never more true. <laughs> um, all right, let's go down to this is this, a good one. Science they, and tech. What are we doing? Science tech. Sure. Let's do I, it. I'm not sure why I put this story in this section, but I'm going to let you read it because it's close to your heart. You may but, have to skim a little bit. It's it's long. The collapse? Yeah. The Were collapse? you just there? Yeah, well, kind of. I was in Arches National Park. The headline is The Collapse of Double Arch, one of Utah's majestic geologic arches stunned park visitors and deprived the state of a popular natural landmark forever. But geologists say its demise was inevitable. Um, so the impressive structure that long Anyway, you don't have to read it. I just, I thought it's interesting that you literally just texted me as you were driving through that park. Have you ever been to Arches? It's the most incredible place I've ever seen. So this particular one though was super famous and it was in Glen Canyon National Recreation Area in Southern Utah. So it's down closer, believe it or not, to Zion where Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid shot. And, um... Did we follow up on that, by the way? Yes, we got emails that that was, in fact, true, that well, the jump into the river took place uh, up in Malibu. You know, I think we're going to have to say we were both right on this. None of the real film was, like, shot there. For instance, Robert Redford and, um, and Newman never, ever shot in Malibu for that movie. But... The river was too shallow, the one in Utah or Colorado. I think it was Durango. And um, so what they did is they, they shot an insert with some stunt doubles. Ah, uh, okay. And they used a plate to, to color in the background mountains, and those guys jumped into that river in Malibu. Okay, got it. All right. So it's a win-win. I think we're both right because technically Malibu appears in the film. Yeah. All right, so, let's go down to this day in history. This day in history, here we go. Slim pickings, man. It's summer, it's boring, but let's see what we got. <laughs> Nothing good happens in the summer. No. Um, the 19th Amendment was ratified um, after Tennessee, by just one vote, became the 36th state to approve women having the right to vote, which is about the time the world went to shit. So, on what, in what year, on this day, was the 19th Amendment ratified? Give or take seven years. Uh, women got the right to vote, I'm going to say 1923. Very good, 1920. Nice! And women... Black men were allowed to vote before women. That's right. I know. So white Damn. women can't be taking that too well. Yeah. Well, um, and you know, the, the black men probably voted that the women not be allowed to vote. Yeah, I hope so. Although they like white women. 
I think I can safely say that. They can I think say, they just voted that bitches not be allowed to vote. According to, we're just going to do this because it's on on the it's on my brain. According to lore, more than two hundred outlaws from regional gangs gathered at Brown's Hole in the American West, where Butch Cassidy proposed to organize a train robbers syndicate, which became known as the Wild Bunch. What year was this, give or take 10 years? 1848. No, it was more recent. I think that's a good guess, though. 1896. Jesus. Yeah. Okay, let me find... uh, Didn't we just do a Butch Cassidy date recently? We sure did. That's why I didn't give you much Uh, of a range on that. hmm. Um. I found some other ones. Hold on. I had to go down to other days here. You'll get the Hitler one. French fashion designer Coco Chanel, with her elegantly casual creations, ruled over Parisian couture for almost six decades. Well, she was born on this day in what year, give or take 15 years? Coco Chanel, born in 1924. No, because she was fucking Nazis in the 30s. Oh, yeah, but, you know, they liked them young, the Nazis. They liked meth and little girls. 1883. What? That's older than I thought. Oh, my God. I Because I was picturing her, like, at runways in the 1970s. Because, I don't know, I sort of think of Chanel, Coco Chanel. So, in 1933, that would put her at 50, right? So... She, but she was already established when she started hooking up with Nazis and then actually doing work for them and asking for a meeting with Churchill and uh, asking for some sympathy on behalf of the Nazis. But anyway, if you haven't seen Bill Burr at Red Rocks, he goes into this a little bit. It is worth checking out. Oh, the Coco nice. Chanel and why she is not canceled. If they're canceling dead people, yeah, um, why not cancel her? Okay, we're going to get one more here. You ready? Yeah. One more. We're coming down to... I don't want to do that one. Uh, do you have any idea when... Sure, sure, we'll do this. American comedian and actor Jerry Lewis yeah. died at 91 years old on this day in what year, give or take five years? 91... Uh, I think he died about seven years ago. So 98 years ago would have been, uh, 2020, 1926. I'm going to say 1926. No, no, no. Well, okay. You have to do a little more math. He died on this day. At oh, 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 he died on that day. All right, I, six, seven years ago, I think he died in uh, 2015. <laughs> Wait, what was your original thing? 26? Yeah. Oh, no, that would have been just off, I think, 19. He was, uh, it's 2017. What did I say? You said 2015, ultimately, okay. with your well, weird math. Well, you know, math. my father hosted Jerry Lewis Telethon in New York. There was... Um, the Jerry Lewis telethon was a very big deal in New York. I don't know if it was that big in every other city, but uh, everybody watched it. It was 24 hours. It was on Labor Day. We- no, it was like 36 hours, and it was on Labor Day weekend, and Jerry Lewis would host 45 minutes of every hour, and then they would go to the local stations for 15 minutes of the hour where they also had – Vegas had their own Jerry right. Lewis telethon filming – Los Angeles, Chicago, like every city had their own. Fi- and my father was the host of the New York section of the Jerry. So he got to meet Jerry Lewis many times and uh, mostly had good things to say about it. He was a huge narcissist. I mean, the ego on this guy oh, was no. legendary. Terrible. Terrible. And he would always steal more time from the local affiliates so he could sing like another song. And it got so sad at the end. He w- And people started making jokes like, Jesus Christ, because they would raise $50, $70 million a year. It's like, when are they going to fix these fucking kids? Jesus, how much money can we throw at this? Um, By the way, your year was exactly, 
on the nose. You said he was born in 1926. And I was right. That would put a 91-year-old dying in 2017. Wow. that's I, I'm on fire with the numbers today. I did the conversion of metric to feet in Korea. Or uh, <laughs> what city was that? You just don't know the country's down. That's all. All right. What are we doing next? All right. Let's do uh, a little merch plug. Don't forget, koozie's still available. Go to fitzdog.com. Uh, summer's still hot, folks. Cool down I'm those getting drinks. getting them out. I am Ten dollars delivered to your door. No extra fees. Uh, let's do some obituaries. Here we go. Some obituaries. Well, they're always sad, but it was sad to see Gina Rollins. But she lived to a ripe old age of ninety-four, and they call her a Hollywood legend and notebook actor. I like that that they separate that yeah. from legendary Hollywood. The yeah. Notebook. Um, and her most celebrated role was as a manic housewife who was institutionalized in A Woman Under the Influence from 1974, which was directed by Cassavetes. Do you know, I've never really checked out, I've never seen, I mean, I think I've seen them, but Cassavetes movies. Um, and I know well, they're legendary. Gloria, Gloria is incredible. Such a strong, I believe she got the Oscar for Gloria. Um, I'm and wondering. Then, uh, didn't she do Woody Allen? She did Woody Allen movies, too. So that's what I might do is go check out some Cassavetes. Yeah. And she stayed. She was married to him and stayed married to him you know, right through till he died. I think no he shit. died. No shit, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. He died a yeah, while, she like was 20 a, years ago, though. She was a badass, strong woman. Um. Uh, all right, then we're also remembering you emailed this famous Amos. Never he heard died. Of him. What? Never heard oh, of him. Died at eighty-eight, and I put this in here because I always knew. I remember. I forget what year I found out he had such an interesting story. So listen to this: famous Amos chocolate chip cookies, right? So after a four-year stint in the U.S. Air Force, where he was stationed in Hawaii, which is where he lived and died at the end, he returned to New York in nineteen fifty-seven. He spent the ensuing years working in the stock room at Saks Fifth Avenue, and then he moved over to the mail room at the prestigious William Morris Talent Agency. In 62, following a number of promotions, Amos became the first black ta talent agent in the history of the William Morris Agency. Wow. Determined to make his mark by signing a blockbuster act, his tenacity was rewarded, get this, when he discovered Simon and Garfunkel. No way. The singing duo the better known. The cookie better. guy? He also helped sign the Supremes. What? Yes. He also helped sign the Supremes. And over the next few years, Amos headed the agency's newly formed rock and roll department, where he worked with Diana Ross, Marvin Gaye, and Sam Cooke. Oh. In 67, Shit. Amos left the William Morris Agency, moved to L.A. where he struggled to set up his own personal ma management company. Burdened with the debt of his failing business, Amos began to take comfort in baking chocolate chip cookies. Quote, I began to bake as a hobby, he told the New York Times. It was kind of therapy. He started bringing the cookies along to business meetings and their popularity wasn't lost upon him. Amos saw an opportunity to leave the talent agent industry through his cookies. Using a modified version of his Aunt Delia's recipe, he planned to open a freestanding cookie store. With financial backing, get this, from Marvin Gaye and Helen Reddy, oh, as, well as, my God. as well as an innovative marketing <laughs> initiative that included an extensive advertising campaign and a gala grand opening, the first famous Amos cookie store opened on Sunset Boulevard in 1975. Within months, 38-year-old Amos had opened two more West Coast locations, and the New York-based Bloomingdale's department store had begun selling the gourmet cookies. Oh, my God. God, how that's cool insane. a story is that? That's amazing. I mean, Very I feel cool. like we're missing chapter three here or act three to the story. What I mean, it went huge. I mean, Famous Amos is like one of the biggest cookies in history. Oh, no, there is an act three. Act three, it faltered, right? And I'm like, oh, what? You know, it's probably because so many corporate guys, just like what's happening in Hollywood now, got in and screwed it up. 
he took the blame. He goes, when it started screwing up is when I then took full charge of it. And he goes, I am not a businessman. I'm a promoter. Yeah. And he owned it. And then the company was bought by who owns the elves, the Keebler elves. Not Gen- it might have been General Mills. Yeah. I'm, I'm doing this from memory. But it was bought by a giant company that kept it going. They re they successfully got it back to its you know its previous brand um, notoriety and um, not notoriety. I'm, I'm I'm getting tired here. Anyway, they got it back to its previous you know brand image and they kept selling it. He remained on the board, remained a spokesperson, and then one of the great things he did is he in any of the famous famous locations he'd go to. There was a reading room because literacy was his biggest cause. And he, every Sunday in the Y store, would read to children. Really? Yep. Uh, I just looked up his net worth. It said that the company sold for $63 million. So I don't know uh, how much of that ended up in his pocket. Um. But they were the first like crisp cookie I ever tasted. Oh like, my God! His net worth was twenty thousand dollars at his when he died. No, that's what it says here. It says, uh, apart from being the mastermind behind the cookie company, he gained recognition for being the author of books such as *Power in You* and *The Watermelon Credo*. Wally's net worth stood at twenty thousand dollars at the time of death. He just it sounds like he should have more money, money than that just from signing Simon and Garfunkel. I know. I know. How many people took money out of this guy's pocket? Jesus. It's amazing. This business, I got to tell you something. This fucking business, you know, just in dealing with selling, you know, you've produced shows and been on staffs and looked at budgets. There was one show that you were on, I won't mention what it was, where the stars manager the management company was a producer his agent was packaging it the production company was just which is a non which is just a bunch of guys saying we own part of the show and by the time the money trickled down to the show you barely had any money left for writers and i remember saying to the star i go do you know what your manager is making on this because the manager made almost as much as the star yeah and also, of course, also took an EP credit, you know, and he would just show up on show night and slap some backs. Yeah. And I made the fatal career mistake of raising the conversation because the star, to his credit, also said, why don't we approach him and say, hey, on this deal, because we're a struggling show and for what you could give back, we could get at least two more writers or three more writers in the writer's room full time. And why don't I pay you the standard 15% or something? Because he was, the manager was making so much more than that because he packaged the show. And holy shit, did I get in trouble for doing that? Yeah, I remember that. That hurt your career. Oh, big time. Yeah. The agency, everyone, even it was my agency who's supposed to represent me. They're like, Gibbons did what? And that's what this business is now. It used to be that there were a few, you know, a good amount of suits, but not that much. And then 90% of it was creative people trying to break into this business, moving out here, all that. I think now it's the other way around. I think 90% of the people trying to make it entertainment are suits. Well, just look at the credits. Trying to ride the backs of 10% of people who actually are creative. Look at the credits on a TV show. I mean, they play the, the opening titles and then executive producer, executive producer. You will see 20 12 executive producers. And guess what? Eight of those people don't even show up to set. They just were able to leverage a title because, you know, they just get they get their hands in the pot and all the money gets sucked out. And that's why the quality is so bad. And that's why we're going to change it, Mike. We're going to start TV shows that go straight to the Internet and at, people donate money to. At Midnight has 14 executive producers two of those are stephen colbert and stephen colbert's wife wow amazing well letterman was a producer on uh kilborn and ferguson right 
Yeah, he fucking owned the hour. Yeah. Colbert no longer owns that. Uh, he doesn't yeah. own that hour. They got rid of that deal. Right. And also, he, Worldwide Pants, that was the name on my check. They yep. ran the show. Yep. Yep. It was Robert, uh, what's his name? Robert, yeah. Uh, wow, why am I? Forgetting his name. He gave me my David Letterman jacket. He's been on the podcast. He took the place of Morty, who I've worked for also. Yeah. Um, all right, let's get to oh, it. Oh, no, because it's Rob. Everyone calls him Rob. What oh, is it? Rob. Yeah, you yeah, threw me Rob. off, but I'm forgetting I'm his name still. His fu- he listens to the podcast. This is embarrassing. He's going to No. Be yes, of course, he does. He lives in Connecticut. He's I always best. had a really good time with him, actually. He'd come uh, out. We'd go out to dinner with Kilborn. Yeah. I was Kilborn's yeah. buffer. All right, Robert let's get Nett. to the funnies. Let's cheer up a little bit. Rob Burnett. Rob Burnett. There we go. And I did not look it up. Funnies. Let's do it. Funnies. All right. Let's start right with the lock horns. We got uh, Loretta walks in the door. She's taking, taking off her coat. Leroy's standing there. She goes, good news. The check engine bulb finally burned out. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Uh, and now we've got uh, her standing there holding a tray. And Leroy is peering surreptitiously out the window, and he goes, it's the Lenharts. They called our bluff about the dinner invitation. <laughs> <laughs> I like this couple. All right, here we go. You guys are not going to like this. So I went and found the, was, oh, it the boy. F- was it the fourth? What did I say it was? The fifth. Fifth. Okay. And it is, you ready for this? Garfield. We're going to do 10 Garfields, everybody. And I got this list. It's the same place that made the other list. So here's number 10. And these are the 10 best Garfield comic strips of all time. So you have to forgive me. I am Garfield's the cat, right? But I don't know the owner's name. So here we go. uh, Odie. You don't know that really, do you? Yeah, it's Odie. You're just going to make me look like a fool? I'm going to say Odie? It's Odie. So Odie has a box in front of him and there's an alarm clock. It's on a tray. And he goes, ahem. There's three frames. In the second frame, Odie's wide-eyed. And he's like, whoa. And Garfield is standing on the table next to him, I think. And then the third and final frame, Odie yells, Garfield, stop giving the dog coffee. And Garfield goes, I have a three-mile leash. I so, have no idea what that means. Uh, um, Do you have any whoa. ideas? So, I I can't even guess what this is about. Whoa. And this is number 10. Garfield, stop giving the dog coffee. He's and yelling Garfield, it. And Garfield's is Garfield in the leash. same room? Uh, and and also this he's he's yelling he's looking one way then he's looking the other way Garfield switches sides, the framing is all fucked up. Okay, I think he caught Garfield giving the dog coffee in the first frame. Now there's something going on with the alarm clock. They probably have a dog. They have to wake up an alarm clock and 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 habitual readers might know what that means. Maybe that's my guess. And then they're like, whoa, and I think the dog ran by, and now he's right. yelling, but Garfield's behind him. Is that an art artistic technique is... that they employ it's where right. it's two frames in one, but they make it look like the same frame? Anyway, I'm going to love these. Dagwood sitting uh, on his chair. It's a different colored chair this week. I think they reupholstered. Oh, it's and... white. He's going to get food all over it. Don't we know that? He's uh, he's not going to get cum on it. He's got a newspaper oh. in his hands, and he says, wow, it says this week set a record-breaking heat index. Blondie has her back to him, as she should. She's reading a book, hopefully like uh, leaving your husband for idiots. And he goes, it reminds me I'd better make sure of something. And she goes, what's that, dear? And he opens the freezer, and he goes, that our ice cream index is higher. Okay, how about this? How about that makes – that reminds me I better – I better make sure of something. What's that, dear? And he goes, that I get your fucking clothes off and on that couch in a few minutes. That's the index that gets to be higher. Oh. All right. We did not have a comic for you guys to caption last week. 
Uh, I just forgot to do it. I've been a little slammed. Uh, this week's caption. And again, if you go to our YouTube page, which is Greg Fitz, I think it's called Greg Fitz Comedy or Greg Fitzsimmons Comedy. Just look me up on YouTube. <laughs> uh, you can watch this podcast. You can look at this uh, frame of a comic, or I can describe it to you. There is a plane. There's a gentleman who looks a little bit frazzled, and he's sitting next to a boy who looks like he's about three. The boy is crying and screaming, and the stewardess points to the boy but is talking to the man and says... I don't know what. You tell us. Is the man also kind of gesturing out the window? I wouldn't read into that. Okay. I mean, if you want to look at the cartoon and make that a part of your caption, that would be fantastic. But I think for the people that are just going with the description, you can just know that uh, she's pointing at the screaming kid and the guy looks like he looks worried. I think okay. you just I think this is what my caption would be off the top first impulse, which is never good. Um this is what you want to use to break that window and throw him out? Like <laughs> cuz it looks like he's like, "Can I throw this kid out the window?" Yeah. Yeah. And she's like, "This screaming kid?" All right. We'll see. People will do better than that, I'm sure. All right. You'll do something good. And then we want to remind you guys that look for my social media on Tuesday. Very big announcement coming. I'm very excited about. Also, don't forget um, to go to what? What do you want to plug, Mike? Boy, I'll tell you what I'm enjoying. Uh, I just finished season three of The Wire. And Jesus, why are all your viewing habits from like the 90s? <laughs> that's like that Jim Gaffigan joke. Like I want to talk about heat now. He, he just saw the movie heat. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, you, so first season of the wire is some people say the best season of a TV show in history. No season four. Oh, that's the one at the schools in the schools. So I yeah. just did the one on the streets where they set up a safe zone, Hamsterdam, where the cops would not prosecute you or arrest you or bust you, and drugs were basically legalized. So yeah. anyway, it was really, but a giant thing happens in the final episode. I won't say what, but I'm very much enjoying The Wire. I won't say what. It wrapped up 20 years ago. No, there's a lot of people like me, and this is a big thing, but there's a lot of people like me who it's on their bucket list. Okay, we'll get to it. Can't recommend it enough. What a bingy show that is. You can watch episode after episode. The story just drives all the way through the season. But it's like a novel. They spend a lot of time on character. Yeah. I don't I don't think your even your kids I don't think could do it. My kids certainly couldn't. Um I think they need more immediate gratification. By the way, you know that guy has a Scottish accent, the guy who plays the lead? I think it's British, right? Oh, yeah, oh sorry. The white guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, no, there's a lot of Brits. And, um, oh, my God, what a show. I mean, you know, you talk about the whole movement, TV, aggressively getting more diverse in 2023. Go check out The Wire. Yeah, I know. The it's most true. incredibly diverse. And let's just say it, like, the it's the cast is mostly minority, mostly black, and they're the most extraordinary actors. Like, it was just such a good show on every gay, level. Gay, they've got gays in there. They got cross dressed. They got everything. You'd love it. Yep. All right, let's wrap it up, uh, Mike. Great episode, and uh, thank you guys for listening. We'll talk to you soon. Take it ish. Take it ish. Take me back to the Sunday Papers podcast. I won't ask if it's online or paperback. Everybody is waiting to see what Greg and Mike have got for us this week. Take me back to the Sunday Papers podcast. I won't ask if it's online or Paperback. Everybody's waiting to see. There might be 
stories, but it's all news to me. 